The event in question happened during my sophomore year in college, back in 2012. I honestly can't remember the exact month, but I believe it was sometime during the winter. At the time I lived with two roommates, Katie and Danielle, and we were the best buds of all time. We had just moved into our first off-campus house, and we were reveling in the freedom of being out of the dorms. With this turn of events came some experimentation with drugs and alcohol. The three of us began hanging out and partying with a group of people who eventually got into harder drugs, like cocaine and molly, etc. Katie and I decided after a while that all of this partying was jeopardizing our health and our schoolwork, so we backed off on the drugs. Danielle, however, decided to continue experimenting and became more aggressive. I should note that I hold no judgment toward drug use whatsoever, but I include it because I believe it may be a crucial component of the events that followed. The saga started on a weekend. We all decided to go to a party one night and got separated from each other. I had made arrangements to leave the party early, so Danielle agreed to walk with Caddy back to the house. We were always adamant about the buddy system at night, however on that night, it failed. Danielle left the party with someone, leaving Katie to walk home by herself. She was unfortunately followed by a strange man. To this day, I deeply regret leaving that night. But I've come to terms with my past decision. I came home the next morning. Katie filled me in on the previous night. She was very upset, which was out of character for her. She told me that she had texted Danielle at some point during the night telling her that she was very bummed out about having to walk home alone. Katie was frustrated, and her text was blunt, but Caddy and I just figured that Danielle would either brush it off or apologize, and things would move on. That did not happen. Danielle flipped her shit, and became completely enraged. She responded very defensively, and told Katie, in very colorful terms, to basically fuck off and get over it. We thought it was pretty odd and hostile, but trying to just carry on with our lives and not overthink it. It was a Monday, so Kitty left the house to go to work on campus, and I went to my afternoon lecture. Sometime while I was in class, Danielle came into Katie's workplace in the student rec center and began screaming at her in front of 60 plus patrons, calling her all kinds of obscenities. She was escorted out of the building by security and somehow made her way back to our house. I should also note that Danielle's mother was visiting this week and was with her the entire time. I believe she was terrified of her daughter, which is why she never intervened. By the time she arrived at home, I had returned from class and was making food in the kitchen. At this juncture, Danielle's rage was centered on Katie, not me. I tried to let the two of them work it out without my intervention, but Danielle cornered me in the kitchen and told me how angry she was with Katie. I have never seen rage in someone's eyes like that. I refused to engage with her and retreated to my room in the back of the house. I sat on my bed and took some deep breaths. That's when I heard Katie coming up the side yard. She was crying on the phone with her mom telling her what had just taken place at work. I immediately felt this horrible pit in my stomach, as I knew they were about to confront each other again. The door opened, and Katie walked in. I was still in my room when I heard them start yelling at each other. Katie stood up for herself, telling Danielle that she was way out of line, and Danny retorted with more obscenities. The yelling turned into full-on screaming, and I had finally had enough. So I went into the living room where they were arguing. Danielle's mom was there as well. I told Danny to knock it off and leave, to which she told me to go fuck myself. This gave Katie time to try to bolt into her room, but Danny followed her and slammed Katie's hand in the door as she was trying to barricade herself. Things had gotten way out of hand. I went outside on our front porch, and Katie followed me outside. A few seconds later, 
We heard Danny's mom screaming for her to put something down. We looked at each other in terror. I told Katie to run away and to call 911. At that moment, Danny flings open the front door, holding a giant kitchen knife raised above her head and screaming at the top of her lungs at Katie, saying that she was going to kill her. By this time, all of our neighbors were standing outside, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. I'm not a very confrontational person, but like hell was I going to let someone kill my best friend? So in a split second decision, I lunged at Danny and somehow managed to get the knife away from her and threw it on the front lawn. I ran to grab it, at which time Daniel had gone back inside to grab another knife. This time, she turned it on herself and asked me if I wanted to watch her end it all. Something had gone terribly wrong with Danielle. Her mother was hysterical by this point, and I kept pleading for her to stop. I then blacked out. When I came to, I was running down the street with Katie. We soon took refuge at our neighbor's house. All the while, we could still hear Danielle's blood-curdling screams down the street. We were totally shell-shocked but grateful to our neighbors for helping us out until the police came. We saw the cops show up a short time later, along with a crisis unit. They detained Danny and drove her to the hospital, where she was put on a psychiatric evaluation. Katie and I never saw Danielle again, and we stayed with some mutual friends for a couple of weeks before returning to that house. We moved out at the end of that year, as the place harbored too many bad memories for us. I later learned that Danielle had experienced a psychotic break triggered by a variety of factors, including stress, drug use, and an underlying mental health condition. This was a huge eye-opener for me to further educate myself about mental health in young adults, as well as appreciate the incredible things your body can do while you're in fight-or-flight mode. It's also taught me a lesson to trust my gut more, as my spotty senses had warned me about Danielle before, but I ignored it. This is somewhat of a convoluted story, so please bear with me as I try to convey everything that I can recall about what led me to the conclusion that my former housemate could have potentially been a serial killer, or one in the making. It was the summer of 2015 when I moved in, and at first appearances my housemate Mike was somewhat normal, if not a bit socially awkward and dysfunctional. When I was signing the papers, he was adamant that I should never go into the basement, which I thought was odd. But I really needed a place to stay, and everyone has their little quirks, so I just chalked it up to that at the time. As I got to know Mike more, I learned about the depths of his dysfunction. Firstly, he used meth. Now, I don't automatically judge people based on vices, but I was surprised at the extent of his use. He is probably the first person I knew who used meth and balanced a full-time job and enjoyed a decent amount of success. The reason this is important to the story is that when he would be around the house, drinking and using, he would start to run off at the mouth, joking that if I smelled a lie coming from the basement, to not think anything of it. It was probably the third time he said this that I asked him why he kept saying that. He responds with, I use chemicals to clean up after the bodies, with a creepy grin on his face. I tried to chalk it up to a bad sense of humor, but it didn't sit right with me. He was also very particular that I let him know about my coming and going and my work schedule. I remember him being shocked and uncomfortable one day that I ended up taking off of work because he didn't realize that I was home. I remember that day because there was a lot of clanging and what sounded like muffled shouting coming from the basement. His car was in the driveway, but he was not in the main house or his bedroom. On other days, he would play very loud music that bumped through the entire house. Sometimes he would even play NPR talk radio 
at very high volumes. In retrospect, I think he may have been trying to mask sounds. He would make remarks about sex workers, saying, You can do whatever you want. You can choke them, or beat them to death, and nobody cares. I took exception to this, telling him that I thought that was messed up. When he would get to tweaking, he would always come back around to alluding to the same kind of violence, talking about he was a normal guy who owned a house and had a good career, so the police would never suspect him. At this point, I think he has gone too far to simply be joking. I was in a weird position. Money was tight at the time, and I didn't have very many options. I tried to convince myself that even if he was messed up, he probably was just engaging in some outward fantasism. I knew that he would acquire the services of sex workers on occasion, but again, I don't judge that kind of activity at face value, but I was becoming concerned. One day when I was doing laundry, I caught a whiff of decomposition. The house we were in was in southeast Portland and was relatively new. Having grown up in upstate New York, I know that animals can sometimes be trapped in the walls and die, but this was in the garage. There were no animals scurrying about. This was both strange and telling to me. I considered carefully what to do, and decided that I would confront him about the smell. I decided to poise the question in a somewhat suggestive way by expanding on his jokes. I told him that he needs to do a better job of cleaning up the bodies because I could smell the decomposition from the garage. I will never forget his reaction. His eyes widened and he shot me a sharp glare somewhere between fear and anger. He stumbled over his words and eventually responded with, What? Really? Yeah, really. There was a few seconds of awkward silence before he said, Thanks for letting me know. He then promptly went to his bedroom and closed the door. A few days after that, he went into the upper crawl space in the garage while I was doing laundry. He called for me and was trying to convince me to come up to the crawl space. My body locked up. My instincts were screaming at me that if I went up there, I would not come back down. I gave him some excuse about having to go somewhere, packed up my laundry, threw it in my room, and quickly left. He spent a lot of time in the padlocked basement without a doorknob. The only way inside was through the backyard. I wish I would have gone down there in retrospect to either confirm or dismiss my suspicions once and for all. In the last couple of months of living there, I was subjected to more graphic comments about women and sex workers, explicit talk of sexual violence, and he was also using more and more. He once showed me a video he made, which featured heavy bondage themes interspersed with sounds of distorted screaming, and this strange leering figure in a plague doctor costume. It was one of those situations where any one of those things by themselves may be innocuous, but as they accumulated together, they became a disturbing piece of art. It was October of 2016 that I finally left there. Taking off to a Native American reservation for a pipeline protest, there were mixed feelings of a call to action and wanting to get out of that house any way I could. I gave him notice that I was leaving. My last night there, he was drinking and tweaking again and eventually started in on the same conversation, loosely describing murder and sexual violence in the tone of some sort of edgy joke. You know they're going to catch you eventually, I said, not holding back my suspicion anymore. He reiterated that he was the last person that the police would ever suspect and asserted that they would never catch him. He said this in a very serious and concise way, dropping the pretense altogether. 
I left the next morning. This haunted me for months, then a year, then a year and a half. It felt as though I hadn't done anything and the guilt was eating away at me. So I called the Portland Crime Stoppers and put in an anonymous tip. When I did, the operator started going back and forth, putting me on hold because the phone call had piqued the interest of the police sergeant who was assigned to the call center. So they were asking me detailed questions about his vehicle, the house, the methods he described, etc. It seemed like they had taken an interest. I gave them as much information as I could and left it at that, feeling just a bit better that I at least tried to do something about it. Fast forward to recent times, I told my mother all about this and she became very interested, asking what house this was and she ended up pulling it up on Google Maps and put it up on Street View. I noticed that there was a large enclosed trailer sitting in the driveway that wasn't there before. I could provide a few theories as to why it might be there, but cannot put together a practical reason for it. Admittedly, this is pure conjecture, but I can't help but wonder. I doubt that I will ever get closure or have my suspicions validated unless he finally gets caught and arrested. I have interacted with many sketchy and unsavory people in my life, but none of them have ever left this kind of impression on me. Make of this what you will, but I hope I never see him again. This happened over the course of a year, when I was between 15 and 16. I am 20 years old now, and it's only been recently revealed to me just how messed up the situation really was. I was obviously still living at home at the time, but my sister, who is seven years older than me, had moved out and was living with her now husband, his high school best friend, and some other guy who they met through one of those find a roommate sites. He was kind of the reclusive nerdy type who preferred hiding in his room watching Star Trek and playing computer games rather than hanging out with the other roommates. And the only person he ever really seemed to want to be around was his similarly shy and nerdy girlfriend. For a bit of context to the story, when this happened he was 28 and she was 24. They were both a bit weird, but initially seemed entirely harmless. For the sake of the story I'll refer to the normal roommate as Frank, the strange roommate as William, and his equally strange girlfriend as Amber. Now, my sister and I have never really had the best relationship with our parents, and at this point things were especially rocky. Our mother was dating a guy who was, to put it kindly, an abusive sack of shit who seemingly hated me and would find any excuse to go off on me. As a result, I spent a lot of time over at my sister's place, it was around this time that William and Amber started to get very strange. As I mentioned earlier, the two of them were always kind of odd. They only ever seemed to want to talk to each other and would even go as far as to ignore anyone else who tried to speak to them. Amber was far worse than William in this regard. He would at least give you brief responses most of the time. Amber had a creepy habit of just blankly staring at you for a couple of seconds then walking away if you asked her a question or tried to engage in conversation at all. That wasn't the strangest thing though. When I would stay over, I would sleep on a futon in Frank's office, which was on the ground floor. It happened to be next to the downstairs bathroom, which for some reason, Amber preferred using to the one upstairs. She would take long showers in the middle of the night, which was whatever. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper, so I generally slept right through them. One night, however, I stayed up super late doing some revisions to my homework. I happened to be awake when she finished one of her late showers. I was too absorbed in my task to really pay attention to anything else, but I definitely noted hearing the shower shut off because it was an indicator of how late it really was. Approximately 10 minutes later, I look up from my laptop and there she was. I always kept the door open just a crack, 
because that room tended to get unbearably hot if I didn't. Amber was just standing there, outside the room, completely naked, watching me through the open crack in the door. I said her name and asked if she was okay, which seemingly startled her, because she then walked away pretty quickly. I convinced myself that in my over-caffeinated, sleep-deprived state, I just imagined the whole thing, and I didn't mention it to anyone. Fast forward around a month later, I head over to my sister's place one night to find Frank a bit agitated about what he perceives to be a peeping Tom problem. He found fingerprints on the outside of his office window in such a way that it implied someone had been pressing up against the glass and looking in. The blinds in this room were slightly too small for the window, so you could see in from the outside, and the room was in the front of the house, with the window easily accessible from the street. He was concerned that some random passing pervert had been spying on him while he was having a private moment in his office, or some potential burglar had been sizing up the joint. The police were called, but since he didn't have any external CCTV at this point, no evidence could be provided, and ultimately, nothing could be done. Soon after, Frank installed both internal and external cameras on the house. This was installed while William and his girlfriend were away on holiday, and I guess everyone had forgotten to tell them about it. A couple of months later, I went to my sister's to find that William's room was empty and was informed that he had moved out. Of course, I asked why, and I was told that he and Amber were a pair of fucking creeps, and the others had collectively decided to kick them out. Apparently, Amber watching me through the office door was not a one-time incident. The security footage revealed that she did this frequently, sometimes for as long as 20 to 30 minutes. I was just usually asleep when she was doing it. Not only that, but the fingerprints on the window had apparently been from William standing outside watching me after I had showered and was hanging out in just a towel, which was a less regular occurrence, but apparently was caught on camera enough times for it to be concerning. As if this wasn't creepy enough, I was recently hanging out with my sister and her husband. He made a comment about how he wished they would have told me the entire story at the time, so that I could have pressed charges. I asked him what he meant by that, and he explained that not only had they been secretly watching me, but the footage also showed they had messed with food and stuff that I brought over, depicting William licking all of my apples and Amber spitting into my orange juice, even dumping regular cow's milk into my lactose-free stuff which explains why I had a period of feeling sick out of nowhere. Apparently, when Frank barged into their room to confront them about it, he not only found several shirts I thought I had misplaced were stolen by them, but they literally hung them up on the wall, along with several drawings of me sleeping and poems about me, whose contents I don't know and really don't want to know. After seeing this, Frank gave them an ultimatum. You have two hours to get the fuck out of this house and never contact any of us again, or I'm calling the police. They took the former option, but I still feel sick thinking of what they were potentially planning for me. Hey everyone, this is your Uncle Unit. Thank you so much for checking out my video. If you have a story that you would like me to narrate on this channel, please send it to my email, unit522submit at gmail.com. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future content. And if you would like to support this channel even further, you can check out my merch store. There's a link for that in the description. I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you stay tuned for the next video. Until then, never forget. So...